Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you lift your voice to the Lord? Tell him hallelujah this morning. Are you here, church? The Bible tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That the righteous run into it and they're safe. Church, he has a great plan for you. He does. And in his name, in his name is found victory. It is. So wherever you are, wherever you are in this life, if you're struggling with something, reach out and proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes it's just the name of the Lord. That's all you can muster up to say. But at the name of Jesus, every knee bows. Every tongue confesses. See, he is king of kings. He is seated in heavenly places, and you are too. And he's king there, and he's king here. And when we say, be glorified in this temple, it's not just in this house of believers, church. It's in this temple. Because in you, he also is king. And by his name, at his name, every knee bows. I think somebody needs a supercharge this morning. I'm not sure where you're at this morning, but I'm inviting you. Wake up this morning. Wake up. Let's go. Let's give him praise. Let's just, from the innermost part of us, give him glory this morning. Let's lift him up. As we lift him up, he'll draw us in, and we'll be right there. Amen, church? Amen. Would you lift your hands to him this morning? Let's worship him. Father, we love you. Jesus, we glorify you. Even as the song said, be glorified in this temple. Lord, as we worship you, Lord, we thank you that you draw us near. Holy Spirit, speak to each one this morning. Have your way in this house today. We're here to glorify you and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. My Savior, Redeemer, you lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, and I will never be the same because you came here. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only Son. You live, you die, you rose again on high. You opened the way for the world to live again. Hallelujah for all.
song says, oh no, you never let go. Through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go. Every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. Oh no, you never let go of me.
have put aside to see your spirit move with power in my life. Jesus, Lord of all eternity, your children rise in faith. All the earth displays your glory, and each word you speak brings life to all. Display. 
know, church, we're going to have to learn how to worship the Lord and go before trouble and go before problems with praise and honor and glory. For God has got this. God has it under control. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be fearful of what's coming because the Lord already knows what's coming. And he has your times and my times in his hands. He loves us with an everlasting love. He sings over us with songs of deliverance and songs of joy. every knee would bow and every tongue would confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ no other is the Messiah. Oh, oh let my eyes see faith Keep your eyes fixed on me. Keep your eyes fixed on me and trust me. Follow me everywhere I lead you. Go where I tell you to go. Stop when I tell you to stop. Lead me and I will guide you through all of the thick that may arise within your life. Fear not at the things that you see around about you, says the Lord. For are they not written in the prophets? For I would say unto you, this is a sign even this day as they attack my nation. my The apple of my eye, says the Lord. My children ones, that Israel tremble in this hour. But know that I am her deliverer. Not only hers, but I'm yours, says the Lord. These things are not coming upon you as something that, uh, like a thief in the night, for I've spoken of them, and my people that are in, in tune with my Holy Spirit and my word can see it. 
So I would say unto you, be not troubled. This is just a part of the plan. It's one step closer to taking you home, says the Lord. So observe it, watch it, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, says the Lord. Even though in your time you won't see it completely. But that prayer will bring over in, even into the millennial reign of my son Jesus Christ. But don't forget this is a part of my plan. So let not those that are standing up trying to interpret uh, what's going on with hardly any information or knowledge of my spirit, but you have those that have spoken even in your scope of influence the things that I've said would happen from times past even to now. For I'm a God that calls those things that aren't as though they were. I declare the end from the beginning. And I say unto you, there's a bright future for those that are my people. So fear not, for I've got this thing under my control and know this says the Lord the time is short yes this generation that saw my country Israel come back even as I prophesied it thousands of years ago into their own land I said it would happen and it happened when it looked improbable I brought it forth says the Lord and it is a sign unto you that you're living in that generation that will not pass away till all things are fulfilled. So keep watching. I'm calling for the watchmen and watchwomen in this hour to draw close to me, to be the spies in the Spirit, says the Lord, so that, the, that my people may know what I'm about. For I've called those in my body prophets and intercessors to take a peek behind the scenes, to see those things that are coming, and, and the sequential events that I shall bring them forth in, says the Lord. So fear not. This is not the end yet, but the end is near, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can be seated. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Come on, church. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Come on, raise your hands to him this morning. Bless the Lord, and all that's within me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and to come. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Let the peace of the Lord come upon you this morning. Amen. <laughs> You see in these things unfold, don't be amazed. Don't be scared. But pray for those people. You say, just for Israel? No, pray for those. You know, there's, there's forces at work that cause the innocent people on both sides to have to suffer. Amen? And uh, I can't wait for the day when those people that always continually want to provoke war for ungodly means and so that they can control everybody come to justice. There was a question we had. Where, what is God's justice? Well, God's justice is found in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, that you would do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. God cares about those downtrodden widows and orphans and even these little children that are being sto stolen. He cares about that. You say, well, why don't he do anything? Why don't we do anything? Amen. At the very least, on your knees and praying about it, breaking the powers of darkness, calling for the expose of these people that are evil. You say, well, it just looks like evil just prevails all the time. Yeah, don't let it fool you. There may be a lot of uh, things that they're showing you on TV and stuff, but I'm telling you, there's good folk behind the scenes, people that they're not talking about. There's things going on. Don't think that, oh, we got so much ethnic division. Everybody's just at odds. No, it's a few on both sides. Amen. But the general people like yourselves and I that love God or love this nation or love the people of the world, we want peace. But the Prince of Peace is coming. Okay? I'm telling you, in light of eternity, this momentary light affliction, that's what the Bible calls it. Now, if you're living 70, 80, 90 years, you're thinking, man, it's been a hard life. Well, if everything was cushy and right, nobody turned to Jesus. That's why you're going to see some things happen in this nation and the nations. But be not afraid. Don't be dismayed. Stay close to your God. Amen. Stay close to your church and your people because we're going to come through it as the glorious church. We're not going out of here. I always like to quote that thing from Battlestar Galactica. As 
ragtag fugitive flea with our knuckles dragging the ground going, woe is me. But the glory of the Lord shall shine upon you and it will reflect out of you to the world. Amen? That's where we've got to display the joy of the Lord even when we don't always feel like it. And you say, well, that's faking it. No, for Christians, that's faithing it. We, we tell our body and our face to do what, what we want done by the Spirit. Amen? Well, I don't feel like Well, stop going by feelings and walk by faith. <clears throat> I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. You know, it's easy when we stand up here under the anointing and say these things, but i got to go home and do the same thing you do every day. But I've walked with God long enough. Come on, some of you older saints say amen. I've seen him pull things out, uh, you know, that, that seemed like it was going to just take a deep dive and crash and burn. But God has a way where there seems to be no way. And he tells us that, that those of us that are in Christ are going to do, we're going to be strong and do exploits in this hour. Amen. We're going to take authority and we're going to display strength. And I'm going to tell some of you Christians that are on the fence. You need to get on over on this side. Because you know what? We're going to be fighting demons. If you haven't had one uh, uh, challenge you through somebody or through the atmosphere or whatever, you better get ready. I'm scared. Don't be scared. You are in authority. Walk humbly before your God. Justice is coming. And maybe it'll happen this side of heaven, and maybe it won't. But I'm telling you, in eternity, it's going to happen. And you know, those of us that are wanting justice, we're going to stand at the great white throne as witnesses to all of the things that have went on in our generation. And I guarantee you, you may hoot and holler when the devil gets thrown in and his fallen angels, but you're not going to like it when you see the humanity that rejected Jesus Christ. So you got some time, I got some time. Pray for your people, pray for your families. Pray for those that you know and love that are far away from the Lord. Pray for your enemies. Bless those that curse us. And pray for those that despitefully use you. Amen? Hallelujah. Because that's what we're called to do. Greater is he that's within you and I than he that's in the world. Amen. Well, with that in mind, this is an offering. Uh, we just thank God that he gives all of us power to get wealth. That means he gives us the ability and strength to work with our own hands. He gives us uh, the ability to get good jobs. Hey, listen, I'm claiming land of Goshen here. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, go back and read about the children of Israel when they went into Egypt. They, they prospered because they were God's people, and the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich was upon them. Guess what? You're the people of God, too. You're part of the family of God. We've been grafted in through Jesus Christ, adopted into the family of God. We have a new bloodline. It's the blood of the Messiah. Amen? And he has given us the authority to trample underfoot those things that we talked about earlier. Amen? Walk in the ways of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, the devil won't be able to, and Mr. Devil don't know who you are. It's the little fuzzballs. Amen. We're really tough. Well, you might be if I didn't know Jesus, but in Jesus, you ain't so big. Amen. Hallelujah. You got to get that mentality. This is a time of war. You know, the, the, the early church had the Lamb of God who came and laid down his life. But, you know, this church, we're coming into the season of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And why are we amazed if we, if we grow up in him with a strong... Uh, a spirit and a backbone cemented in concrete and steel, and that we're, we're ready to fight, not people, but devils. Amen? I love it when God's people start praying, and if we could see behind the scenes, you'd see those devils go, oh, man, that's too bright. They're shining too bright. You know why? Because the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. Can you say amen? amen. That's a good offering. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap this morning? Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Hallelujah. And don't forget his benefits, who heals all your diseases. Amen. Um, so with that in mind, I have a prayer request for uh, the husband of Judy. It's a friend of Angie. I, I guess his name's Jim. Well, you know, God knows who he is. And since they're requesting prayer for him, Jim's got cancer. And uh, you know what? I believe God's a healer. Amen. And then also another thing we need to do is we need to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
You say, but it don't look like it's going to happen. It probably won't happen. I don't care. The Bible says you're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen? And pray for all those people over there and, and the innocents, like I said before, on both sides. Dragging women and children out of the house. And now Israel's going to go and bomb the living daylights out of, out of them. They'll probably hit some of the Hamas, but you're going to hit, you know, their bombs are going to hit a lot of old people and little kids and stuff. Somebody might go, good riddance. Well, you need to get saved. <laughs> That's how you think you need to get saved. Amen. That's not God's heart. You say, well, he hates Palestinians because they hate it. No, he don't. He loves everybody. For God so loved the world. Amen. This is the governments of men that can't handle life. You know, until Jesus comes back, all of these kingdoms are going to begin to crumble more and more. The financial systems are going to crumble. And, and, you know, by the time we're taken out of here, the Antichrist will have almost had his fist clenched around religion, around government, around monetary systems. But you know what? The cool thing is we frustrate him because he can't come all the way on the scene because we're here. We are a saving grace with Christ in us for the world. And when we go, all hell literally is going to break loose. Amen. Well, we have uh, some things that we want to announce, and we'll have Pastor Emily come on up here and transition on over. Yeah, come on up here. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Told you, sometimes I have Swiss cheese. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, not only for Jim, Judy's husband with this cancer, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that if he doesn't know Jesus, he'll come to know Jesus. Lord, uh, be his strength. Be the strength of the family in this time, Lord, when they're struggling and in fear. We thank you, Father, that in Christ there is no spirit of fear that can touch us. So, Lord, if he's not in Christ, first of all, bring him to Christ in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Israel. We lift up the Palestinian innocents over there, the children. We, we, we lift up all the innocents in Israel. Lord, that chaos and commotion that's been going on throughout the world. Lord, we know that uh, you didn't bring it, but you'll utilize it to bring people to their knees to, to, to worship you and to accept your son, Jesus. Let that be the fruit that comes out of this chaos. And then, Father, we also lift up our sister Tina this morning, Lord. Who's, who's recovering from back surgery and we went and seen her yesterday and she was so full of pain God but I ask you in Jesus name to expedite the healing of her back Lord to uh, cause that pain to be very minimal in Jesus name recover fasting in the name of Jesus and if you're in agreement with that say amen amen, amen. here you go Emma. thank you for reminding me thank you pastor <laughs> good morning Everyone say next Sunday. Louder. <laughs> next Sunday, we're having a pastor appreciation dinner. The church is going to provide the good old fried chicken. And then everyone else provides everything else. <laughs> so here's a sign-up sheet. I'm going to start over here. <laughs> That's cold. Thanks, Mary. Um, one thing as the kids come up, come up, kiddos. On October 29th, we're having our Hallelujah party. There are sign-up sheets for games and the chili cook-off, which we're really having a chili cook-off. I have prizes. Contest. Thank you. Um, they are on the back table. Um, more info will be provided probably next week. Um, but just FYI, if you want to sign up early, go for it.
morning. What's that? I love your shirt. Thank you. I like this shirt too. That's a little bit much. Uh, let's go to our Bible. Let's look at. Uh, let's go over to Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in chapter 15 and and uh, Luke chapter 15 verse 11. And we're going to see where the Lord takes us. Um, <clears throat> just for full disclosure, I've been. I've been struggling with a little bit of a cough and head cold and all that junk that's been going around these last couple days. So I'm going to give you all I got. And when we're done, we're done. You guys good with that? Hallelujah. Let's look at Luke chapter 15. And as you go there, let's pray. Father, we love you. We glorify you. We thank you for all the blessings you poured out in our lives. Lord God, we thank you that we've been sealed by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that because uh, we're filled with your spirit, all fear all doubt, all anxiety, all despair has to go in Jesus' name because we fully put our trust in you. We love you, we honor you, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How, how many of you know that we're living in a world that has lost its mind? The world that we're living in, the people that we're called to serve, we have people that are losing their minds because of things that are happening and uh, the unrest that is going on amongst people and cultures and, and nations and in governments, and I'll say this, there's no greater hope, there's no more important peace that we can have than the, the peace and the hope that we can find in Jesus Christ. Amen. And here's the thing, we've been on this series of asking questions all summer long into the fall, and here a few weeks ago we talked about uh, where do we come from, why are we here, can you say amen, amen. what happens to us after we die, and, and this is this is kind of a, a, an addendum or an add-on to that, is like, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? We live in a generation where people are looking for something. Can you say amen? They're looking for a group to be a part of. They're looking for validation. We're looking for identity. We're looking for something that is greater than ourselves. Can you say amen? And in Luke chapter 15 and verse 11, we get a parable that Jesus gives. A parable is a story uh, that would have been common to uh, the Jews of Jesus' day. And it's not just some, uh, 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 a nice little fairy tale. How many guys know that these are real stories about real people? Can you say amen? These are not, these are not fictional uh, creations that come out of the mind of men, but these are real stories. And a parable has a greater meaning, and it's not even some fable that we grew up learning in in nursery or in uh, in preschool and in, in elementary school, it's not the not the pair not this uh, not a fable like uh, uh, slow and steady wins the race, the story of the tortoise and the hare, or the the little mouse and the elephant. It's not about that, but there's a great significance in the stories that Jesus shares, and Jesus shares so many parables through his teaching. These are object lessons, and then in verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. This is a demanding younger son. Can you say amen? He had an inheritance. It's kind of like our kids these days. It's like, what do you got plans? And all of a sudden, I got a 14-year-old daughter, and she's now telling me her plans. Can you say amen? It's like, what, Dad, this is what I'm doing. Well, sounds like you haven't fully thought of your plan. Well, I need this so I can do my plans. It's like, great, you do not have a co-collaborator in your plan, so how are you going to execute your plans? And then because she's got a loving dad and, and one who gives in, I'm a yes dad, so I end up saying yes, and I figure it out for her. But <laughs> what's that? Uh, it's my fault. It is my fault. The pickles I get in with my kids are of my own creation. And my wife reminds me of that often. Well, here we, we see this parable, but I can see that he was not only was this a lost son, but it's likely he was a persistent son. We don't get the full story, but I'm sure just like in our relationships, this wasn't the first time that the younger son had brought up like, hey, dad, you got an inheritance. We got a farm. We got some ranch land. We got a vineyard. We got whatever he has at your disposable. I know when you die that a portion of this is coming to me. Why don't you break me off a chunk of it now? And, and I'll go figure it out. That's a big ask. Can you say amen? And it wouldn't have been, I don't think, I, this is my interpretation. It wouldn't have been the first time. It would have been a son that's like, give me this. I'm looking, the son is looking for something else than what he has in front of him. 
and we look at this parable, and it's the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. Here's the deal. When we read this, and we'll continue reading this, he does not get lost when he leaves his father's house. He doesn't start searching for something when all of a sudden he's eating with the pigs. The truth is, is he's already lost inside of his father's house. He's blinded by the blessings that are around him. And he's looking for something else. He's blinded by the blessings that are around him. And he's looking for something else. So he petitions his dad. He says, Dad, you're getting old. You're going to die. Break off my inheritance now. Now, I remember growing up as a kid, there was a time where I thought 35 years old was really old. <laughs> it just was. When I'm, like, when I'm like 13 years old and my mom and dad are in their early 30s, I'm like, man, my parents are old. <sighs> and then I turned 35. And I realized 35 isn't as near as old as I used to think it is. And then I break 40. And 40's not as bad as I thought 40 was going to be. And I break 44, and I'm going, my best days are left in front of me. Can you say amen? Amen, amen my end's going to be greater than my beginning. Because I've got all the wisdom I've experienced through the years uh, to get better. But hallelujah. How many know sometimes we lose perspective of time? Amen. And, and we, we get in a rush of everything that's going on, and I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make something happen. I'm getting, I'm getting dissatisfied. I gotta, I gotta change a job. I gotta change a friend group. I gotta, something's gotta change. Something's gotta change. And, and those that are always looking for change, we're changing the external when the place that really needs to change is of the heart because we get blinded by the blessings that are around us. I'm sure this son looked at his older brother and thought, hey, that's dad's favorite son. He's really got it made. He's going to get the double portion blessing. Dad lets him coast. But as an oldest son, let me say this. I am an oldest, so I can, I can vouch for this. There's, there's greater responsibility when you're the oldest in a family. Can you say amen? Hey, if something goes wrong in my family, whose fault is it? It's my fault. It's my fault as the oldest son. It, it just is. It's like, if I would have prayed more, if I would have called, if I would have sent a text, if I would have said thank you, if I would have gone over and helped, if I would have done this, then they wouldn't be in the predicament that they're in. And this is how I know when there's challenges going on in my family. All of a sudden, everybody goes radio silence. And nobody's reaching out about anything. And then I got to call up my brother and go, what's going on? And then he spills it out. And anyways, that's the responsibility of the older so it's not always easier, and, and the young, the babies of the family, let me just say this, you guys got it made. Having a baby in my own family, he, he's, he gets treated differently than all the other kids. I knew this when he was 18 months old. As soon as my daughter could sleep in her own bed, boom, she's in her own bed. As soon as the baby in the family could get in his own bed, he found his way on the couch. And his mama said, he gets to stay. And... I couldn't veto that vote. But here's the thing. The challenge, no matter what, and, no, and you're like, you forgot about the middle kids. Everybody forgets about the middle kids. So if you're a middle child, um, we see you. We see you. We, we, we see you kind of. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, hallelujah. 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 Um, where are we at? Oh, no matter, here's the deal. No matter what our birth order is, and we all have our cross to bear and what place we're born in our families, um, let's not get blinded by the blessings that are around us. Back to verse 12. And the younger said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that fall, f falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He was living life about himself. Everything, like, 
I'm not going to say it. <sighs> Maybe there are some elected officials' kids that fit this bill. <laughs> not just current, but other ones as well. Living life for themselves. And if, you, and if you want to take a snapshot of what's purported as success in this generation, it is what we'd call prodigal living. It's living life with credibility. It's finding followers. It's trying to be an influencer. If you ask a 10-year-old now what they want to do for a living, you do not get, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a fireman or a police officer or a nurse. On a rare occasion, you'll find one that gives a real, I want to build houses, I want to work on cars. You will not get that answer from the average 10-year-old, especially the average 10-year-old boy. If you ask a 10-year-old boy what he wants to do for a living, he will say, I want to be a YouTube creator. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. I want to sit behind a desk with a camera recording every minute of my life and expose everything to everybody else. And that's their goal. And I've seen it with my own eyes because you see contraptions of kids setting up things so they can live stream their video games. <sighs> they get creative when they start pursuing a passion. Our job as parents is to guide that passion into something that is productive. Can you say amen? But prodigal living, living life for women, living life for toxic relationships, drinking, drugging, hanging with, the, with a certain crowd, being around people who do not want the best for you. We've all had those people in our lives that have been around us. They're hanger-ons. They're only there as long as we can give them something. As long as we're, they're the friends that know when to show up when it's payday. Where are we going out to eat? <laughs> we? You have, a, you have a frog in your pocket? Because there ain't no we in this. This is what we doing. We are getting ring of red, loaf of bread. We're living on beans and rice, rice and beans. How do you think I afford the house that I'm living in? It's not by spending my money all the time on, on Taco Bell and Burger King. Can you say amen? <laughs> they're the ones that show up when, when everything, when there's a surplus, but when there's lack, they're nowhere to be found. They're the ones that know when to call when they're moving from one place to another place because they know all their friends that have a truck. And they call them up. Come help me move. I'm in a pickle. I'm three months behind on rent. The landlord is evicting me this weekend. It's like, did you not have the last three months to figure this out? And you're calling for a bailout now? And then when you're the good friend, you're going like, hey, we're doing some work in the backyard. Could you come over? Man, I'm super busy. I just, I just can't get it. The, the friendship is, a, is one direction. It's a take-and-take take relationship instead of a give-and-take relationship. <clears throat> he surrounded himself with those types of friends. I'm sure as he cashed out his portion of, of his inheritance that he was surrounded by a lot of girls, surrounded by a lot of hanger-ons, but they only lasted as long as the money lasted. There will be some people in our lives that only hang around as long as we can give them something, and they'll move on and they'll exploit someone else. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country in verse 13, there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. See, I found this out is that it's easy to go ahead and spend and spend and spend as long as you've got a means to make. But there comes a time where famine does hit the land. No matter what the government categorizes or redefines it, we're in, a, we're in an economic recession and a depression right now. Can you say amen? I feel it every single week as I go to the grocery store, every single time I fill up my truck or my car with gas, as I get my new insurance rates. As I get my recent tax bill, all of a sudden, my house is worth more than it has ever been worth in my entire life. And the government says, here, we're going to keep your, we're, gonna, we're not going to raise taxes. Well, I'm paying more. 
So that sounds like a raise to me. Amen. See, the young man, the prodigal son, had learned how to, he was dependent upon what he had in his hand and had forgotten to be dependent upon God. See, when we have abundance, it's easy to think that we're all that in a bag of chips, that we're the ones that are our own supply until that supply runs out. Wouldn't it have been smarter for him to put a little bit of a way for a rainy day, save a little bit for a hard time, rather than use it all up? It astonishes my mind that Jesus gives us these parables 2,000 years ago Yet as people, we find ourselves so relating to this son. Let's learn our lesson. Back to verse 14. But when he had spent all, there rose a severe famine in the land, and there and he began to want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to sweet feed swine. This would have been a good Jewish boy. He would have attended synagogue on a regular basis. <clears throat> Pork would have never been in his diet. Yet alone, keeping pigs near the house. Of all the animal, like I'm not, uh, you guys know this, I'm, I'm not a big animal person because animals stink. They just do. And like even the little furry ones that run, yes, they do too. But I fell in love with the woman who loves dogs, so guess what I do? I love dogs through her. <laughs> I do. I do. And she, she reminds me, she's like, you love them. And I'm like, I love you. <laughs> and I love you with such a great love that it extends to the, to the animals that you love. <clears throat> I'm not a big farm guy, because farms stink. And you're like, but I love, there are certain smells that I like that would be offensive to someone else. Like for me growing up, there's no, nothing better, no better smell than this. I shared with my friend back here a couple weeks ago. No better smell than getting into an old work truck yeah. that smells like men who have put in a hard day with a little bit of a tinge of nicotine, gasoline, and asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> And you're going like if they made that in like if they made that type of perfume for my wife, it'd be like it'd be all over. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But it'd be but that that sense would be offensive to 99% of y'all. It totally would be. But someone who grew up in that environment, it's it brings back a fantastic memory. It's like walking into an old garage where transmissions have been torn apart. And breaks have been done. Yep. There's a certain smell. There's a mustiness from the water cooler. And you know guys have said a lot of things in that room. A lot of cursing, but there's also been a lot of sharing of blessings. For this young man, the stench of the pigs would have been overwhelming. It would have infiltrated every part of his being, his clothes. The smell in his, stuck in his nostrils as he laid down at night, taking care of these unclean animals. A revelation that he was just as unclean as he grew up thinking these animals were unclean. He joined himself, back to verse 15, he joined himself to a citizen of that country, which means he became enslaved. He had a debt. He had extended beyond what his means, and the only way that he could make it was to sell himself. He was a sellout. What are we selling out our lives for? What have we joined ourselves or who have we joined ourselves to that's only there taking advantage of us in a temporary way? Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him to feed the, into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He was a favored son in his father's house, and he was a forgotten slave in an enemy's field. He 
his life was worth less than the pigs that he was tending. Because they saved the leftovers and the slop to feed the pigs. But the Jewish boy from far away had come to live into the house. We don't need to take care of him. It's more important that the pig lives than the person lives. It's more important that in our generation that people have choice than a baby lives. It's more important to save this wildlife creature than for a life to be saved. Verse 17, but he came to himself, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He had lost it all. His heart was empty. So was his stomach. He had hit his rock bottom. He had had it up to here. See, I'm sure in this young man's life, there were times, there were seasons, there were moments where he woke up next to someone he shouldn't have woken up next to and thought, man, it can't get any worse than this. I don't even know her name. There are other times that I'm sure he had been partying late at night with a crew of strangers going, who are these guys? And what are we doing? It's likely he would have uh, done things to help temporarily fill the gap. I can't believe I'm taking that. I wasn't raised that way. That's not mine. Lying to get out of trouble. Breaking commandments. Young people, seasoned saints, they're Ten Commandments. They're not Ten Suggestions. And if we honor our father and mother, God will bless us with long life. Don't, don't lie. People always believe what's coming out of your mouth. Don't steal. Can you say amen? But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants had bread enough in despair? And I perish with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This likely would have been a conversation he would have had in his mind over and over and over again, just like we have those conversations in our mind. And those that have been far from God and are now near to him, I'm sure those are the conversations you had in your mind. When I get to my father's house, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to come. I'm going to throw myself down at the altar. This is what's going to happen. And this is how it's going to be over and over again. And then the next day comes. And nothing's changed. Because nothing changed until he had it up to here. Until he literally came to the end of himself and hit that rock bottom those that are far from the Lord today what what's it going to take for you to hit your rock bottom if you know what it's going to take then today's the day to come back to the Lord Amen. <clears throat> verse 20 and he rose and he came to his father and he was still a great way off his father saw him and had compassion, <clears throat> and fell on his neck and kissed him. There's no way the father would have known the day that his son was going to return. No social media post, no iMessage, no quick phone call, not even a call collect, Dad, I'm coming home. We see through this that it would have been likely the father would have been looking for his son every single day. He still loved his son. He loved him from afar. But he loved him, and he loved him so much that he wanted him near. <clears throat> his father ran out to meet him, to greet him. 
overwhelmed with joy that the lost son was returned. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. It was a time to celebrate what was found instead of mourn of what had been lost. Can you say amen? See, we go through life and some of us have a, have a propensity in our own personality that we look at the things that aren't there instead of appreciating the things that are, are there. It's, it's simple to look out and go, man, I don't have this, I don't have this. We compare our lives with what other people have. Uh, we see somebody else's marriage and go, man, if, if my husband just treated me like that, then I would love him the way that she loves him. Or if, I, if my kids behaved the way their kids behaved. Or if I drove the car that they had, or I lived in the house, or had this opportunity and we look at everything we don't have instead of celebrating what we do have. This is time for this, this father that he could have sat there and, and he could have looked at the dark side of it and go, man, I lost years with my son. Uh, uh, up to a third of my farm had been sold off so this guy could go be a dork. <laughs> Can you say amen? It's like he could have looked back and gone like, man, how was your trip? It cost me about $1 million. I hope you got your money's worth out of it. It could have been a time of mourning that lost time of relationship. And don't you know, during this time that you could have, you could have married one of the, you could have been married to one of the, commu the girls in the community and you would have had your family. And, and by this point, I would have had grandkids by now. But because you are a bonehead, I don't even have that. Sometimes when we look at what we don't have, it gets real easy to beat something down rather than to build someone up. The father didn't take that, uh, take that position. It was like, no, it is time to celebrate what we have. My lost son is found. Bring the fatted calf here. This would have been the special animal that they would have uh, failed a higher, uh, fed a higher portion to, that has fed a higher quality of grain. This would have been a, a calf that would, would have been set aside for a purpose. It would have been set aside for a wedding. It had been set aside to celebrate with the community. It would have been set aside for, for something great. And the father didn't hesitate to bring out his best. The son returned at his worst, and the father responded with his best. Verse 23, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. It would have been an exciting time. Strike up the band. Let's celebrate what's lost is now found. That's why when we gather together and we sing praise at the beginning, when we come to gather, gather and worship, we open up our service with a celebration because what has been lost is now found. And we open up a song with like, My Savior! My Redeemer! He lifted me up out of the miry clay. It's a song of celebration to be glad unto the Lord, to celebrate as a community together the goodness of God because we were all lost and now we are found in Him. It's a reason to celebrate. It's a reason to make a sacrifice. And... We stand there sometimes with our hands in our pockets or our arms folded. We set a little mental timer 
of when is this going to be over so we can get to the important stuff. If we're waiting for worship to get over so we can get to the important stuff, you've missed the whole meaning of the important stuff. That man, I'd, we come in here and we, we pray those prayers. God, I just want you to break every chain off of me. I want to be truly free, all fear going. God, I can't live like this anymore. And we have an invitation to freedom. And we shrink back into our fear. And we wait for something else. There's the time to be merry. And I understand that there's chaos that's happening in the world. And I know that the love of many are going to grow cold in our generation. And we're going to see and hear more and more uh, uh, exposures of people lying and cheating and stealing and government officials and heads of state doing crazy things in, in the name of themselves that's going to hurt people. Amen. And we can be those that shrink back and go, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. Or we can be the people of God and go, you know what? It's time for me to rise up in my generation and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ that I was the one that was lost and now I'm found and the Lord's put a new song in my heart, a new song in my mouth and I get to sing my Savior, that he is my God, he's my deliverer, he's my redeemer, he's my healer, he's my provider, he supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory, that he's my redeemer, that I've been bought back with the price I've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. My family may think this. This world may think this. The people I'm around, I may think that I'm absolutely worthless. But God looked down and said, you're worth the precious blood of my son, Jesus Christ. And I bought you with the price. Not so that we can stand like bumps on a log, but so that we can stand up and sing praise to our God because he has changed us. He's transformed us. He's renewed us. He's made us alive. He's broken the curse of the law. Every single chain, every single chain has been broken. My sins are forgiven. Relationships are restored. And I have a new purpose in my life. And instead of Mourning what is not there, I'm going to celebrate what is there. Because what was if the lost son can be found, the lost time can be restored. The broken relationships can be regenerated. In Christ, we are new creation realities. And we miss it sometimes because we're looking for the lights or the smoke, or we're looking for this. We have the prophetic word. We have a more sure word of prophecy. It's called the word of God. And just as important as that is we have the Holy Spirit alive inside of each and every single one of us. And we stand back and look at what we don't have. And when we spend that time looking at what we don't have, we get blinded. We don't appreciate the blessings that are in our lives that the Father came to give His best. And our Father sent His Son and gave us His best. <clears throat> Verse 25. Now His older son was in the field, and he came and drew near in the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called to one of his servants and asked him what these things meant. See, this is the lost son too. Because he didn't even have a clue what was going on. See, we can have lost relationship and be in the same house as well. The son would have been so disconnected from what his father was doing that he didn't even know. How could he not know if he was in relationship with his father? Because if he had been right there with his dad, he would have heard like, hey, when your little brother comes back, this is what we're going to do. Like as, as, we, as we read in the parable, the servants knew exactly what to do. Yes. Why? Because they were, it's like, were they waiting for that moment? They were waiting for that moment to be told this is when you do it. Yes. But the plans were already in place. Yes. I'm sure as the father stepped up over the hill, the servants were going, he's going up there again? He's going up there again? Like it's been years. Like we've 
how many, how many Sabbaths and how many uh, Yom Kippurs and Rosh Hashanahs and, and Pentecost have we celebrated? And this guy keeps going. And then you have the one servant that's going, hey, remember what he told us. When the sun comes back, we give the best. It's time for a party. It's time to celebrate. They knew exactly what to do. Why? Because even the servants were near the father. The servants were nearer to the father than the oldest son. Because if the oldest son would have been near to his father, he would have known what the party was all about. And he missed it too. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. See, we can serve and not have a relationship. I've never transgressed your commandments at your time. There's a little bit of pride and arrogance in his tenor and tone. Can you say amen? amen. See, we, we look at this. This is coming up in a conversation I had with my wife this week. We all know the proverb that pride comes before what? Pride comes before fall. And I look, I primarily look at it this way, and I think it's the right way. When we start puffing ourselves up, we look, we think we're all that because we've achieved things, we've had goals attained, people have commended us, we've got recognition, we got status, we have a track record, we have the things, and then all of a sudden we think it's all because of us, and we know that the Spirit of God inside of us. And it only takes one moment for the anointing to come off and we get revealed for who we really are. Yeah. There, there's a pride in that of thinking ourselves yeah. too much. There's also a pride of thinking you don't need anybody else that leads to a fall. We become too independent. Can you say amen? That I'm going to do this on my own. See, he, the oldest son was so arrogant that he thought that just because he did what his father told him to do, that he knew his father's heart. We need to know the father's heart. Can you say amen? <clears throat> but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a goat that I might, might make and marry with my friends. As soon as, the son, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. So he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Two lost sons. And if the older son comes to a revelation, he would have known that had he been in a relationship, he had been celebrating with his dad too. He had been excited. What are we looking for? We're looking to love and to be loved. Can you say amen? Yes. We're, looking for, we're looking for someone to throw us a party. We're looking to throw a party for someone else. Both sons needed to be found. They're both found in the father's love. We can only be found in the Father's love. Longing, searching to love and be loved. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, let's go over there. <clears throat> See, as we read the parable of the lost son, we find out that the oldest one of the party celebrated too. Can you say amen? He is blinded by his blessings.
as we go over to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, I just feel prompted to say this. Sometimes all someone else wants is to be loved. Can you say amen? Sometimes all someone else wants is to be loved and to know that they're loved and to know that they're appreciated and that they're cared for. Can you say amen? And some, we, we have this thing in our generation, in our culture, that love is so conditional on the way we show love and the way we receive love. Can you say amen? Like I've, re- I've read the book, The Five Love Languages. How many of you guys are familiar with that? And it gives great insight. Can you say amen? But it actually can be a great deterrent as well. Why do you say that? That's not the way I get loved. Don't they know my, my love language is acts of service and words of affirmation. And they, they only love me in this way, in this way, in this way. But they don't love me the way I want to be loved or the way I need to be loved. Come on. Well, this is the only way I show love. Well, that's the only way I show. I can only show love this way. I can only show love through physical touch. We boxed ourselves in. Some of you know what I'm getting at. Because it builds up a wedge. Instead of just going, you know what? This is what I see. I see if, if you're a wife, if you have a husband that gets up early in the morning, works all day, doesn't spend all of his money at the quick shop and at McDonald's and comes home and he goes, takes the kids to soccer and helps out with this and helps out. The, that's him showing you his love. But I really want, I really want to spend more quality time together. Well, guess what he's got to do to afford that quality time? He's got to go to work so that you can go spend $5,000 on a vacation. And so you get one full week every other year. But I want it more often than that. Well, let me say this. If you get more time with him at other times in the day, he makes less money. So which one do you really want? I just one hint. Well, until until the refrigerator goes out, until the washing machine goes out, like how are we going to get this? Well, we're going to go down to the used place, and we're going to get this. And you're going, well, all that extra free time with you, that don't pay the bills. <laughs> Is that too close to home? <laughs> <laughs> on the on the other side is is like hey can you just can you just be thankful that you have someone that comes that's there in the evening and cooks you a warm dinner and has it on the table for you and is serving it with a smile especially work yeah, here's the it's implied it's implied that we all work in all day every day and maybe everything isn't picked up in the house, but the house ain't dirty. It may not be clean enough for company, but it ain't dirty. <laughs> right? It's one of the things when we used to have friends come over at the house on a regular basis. We used to do it on a regular basis. Like, gave us a good opportunity to deep clean the house. So I knew at least once a month the house was getting deep cleaned by everybody. But here's the thing is we, we start to set these parameters and these conditions on the way We're loving each other. And how we're going to love each other. And we get frustrated and irritated. And and here's the deal is most of us aren't going to be completely synchronized in the way we show love or receive love. And that's okay. Because if you were like your spouse, if you had the exact same personality as your spouse, if you were too much alike, then one of you would not be necessary. (laughs) That you need people to compliment you. That for those of you that are introverted, you need the extroverted spouse so that you will leave the house and do something fun. 
for those that are introverted. You need that introverted spouse. Those of you that are extroverted, you need that introverted spouse so that you leave the gathering at a reasonable time. <laughs> and you don't talk to everyone about everything. Like you need that balance in your lives. You need a spender and a saver. Because if you are both spenders, you're going to have to get a lot of promotions in order to pay the bills. You don't need to be both being savers. Why? Because then you're not generous in your giving. That's right. And you need to have someone who's generous and someone who has wisdom at the same time. Yes. Amen. You need to have someone in your life that will speed things up and you need someone in your life that will slow things down. Because yes. if you both are living in high gear all the time, you're going to get burnt out and burned up and you will take it out on each other. Sometimes this is, this is the way it is. Sometimes there's one person who's empty, and they just need to be filled up by someone else. That's right. You're right. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. It's like I'm empty. I don't, have, I, can't, I don't have a whole lot to give today. And I just need, I don't need... I just need you to tell me I'm good looking and I smell good and I'm a good dad and I, I'm, I'm a good husband and that's, that's, that's all I need sometimes. That's right. Right. Amen. I just need to not feel like I have to do everything all the time. Right. And then my wife goes, he doesn't do everything all the time. I didn't say I need to not do everything all the time. I said I need to feel like I don't have to do everything all the time. Sometimes it does come into feelings. And sometimes my wife just needs appreciated and thanked. And sometimes she just needs like, go with your girlfriends. I'll see what the credit card statement looks like next month. <laughs> and just go. Be wise, but have fun. And my wife's like, sweet, they got one coming up. And then we'll figure it out later. <laughs> you didn't hear about that one? I'm sure you heard about this one. Let's talk about our love for the Lord. And we'll start to wrap up here. Are you getting anything out of this this morning? First John chapter 4, verse 9 says this. <clears throat> we love him because he first loved us. Well, I don't feel loved today. Well, the truth of God's word supersedes your feelings. You're loved by God. Well, who loved, who loved us first? I loved, I loved the Lord, but he loved me before, before I loved him. Amen. Now, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. That God demonstrates his own love towards us. That he sent his son, Jesus. How much great, no love is greater than this, than a man lay his life down for his friends. Amen. We love him because he first loved us. And how do you know how do you know someone who has a great revelation on the love of God for their life? Here's a couple things. They worship God wholeheartedly. Because he who's been forgiven much also loves much. When you, when you understand the gravity of sin and in comparison with the greatness of the love of God, you just get overwhelmed by his goodness. It's like, but my sin wasn't that bad. I didn't go do what the prodigal son did. It's bad enough to separate you from a loving father. And for that to be forgiven, for that debt to be paid, is something to celebrate. Yes, it is. Amen. That he loves us. Mm -hmm. He loves us first. Yes. And he loves us with his best. Yes. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. Matthew 22 and 37. Actually, we'll start in verse 34. <clears throat> and when the Pharisees heard 
that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were kind of opposite sides of the coin. They were um, <clears throat> in a juxtaposition of trying to get power over the children of Israel. Neither of them were legitimate, but they had their, it's kind of like, they're almost like the Democrats and the Republicans. They're kind of the same, but just enough difference. <laughs> but they were always up against each other. When the, but they had a whole lot more in common than they had differences. But anyways, when the Pharisees heard that they had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. They're like, sweet, our opponents lost one. Let us rejoice. Then one of them, a lawyer, leave it up to a lawyer, can you say amen? Asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And actually, lawyer is, actually, it's a scribe is who asked it, but they thought themselves as lawyers. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? <clears throat> then Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You fulfill these two laws. Love God and love people. You're in a good spot. Can you say amen? Yeah. <coughs> this is a verse that if you get a revelation of it, it will transform your life. Back in our day, we called them power verses. Did we not, Christy? verse that you hid in your heart. Verse that you go back to often because you need it. A verse that's a reminder of who you are and what he's done. A verse that leads to deeper, a more profound revelation of other verses. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, it feels good to be under the anointing. It's, it's, it's nice when people appreciate what's been shared under the anointing. Um, being appreciated is great. It's awesome to be recognized. Um, it, makes, it, makes, it makes the heart happy. Um, it also keeps the soul humble. But the reason we're obedient to the call of God is because of the love of God. The reason I share the gospel with those around me isn't because I'm under, it's, because, it's not because my right arm is being pulled behind my back by the Holy Spirit and I'm being compelled by force of pain uh, to somehow submit to the will of God. But the reason I share the love of God with other people is because they need to hear the same good news that set me free. That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That you put God first and foremost, and I used to think about this scripture for years, that it just meant God goes number one in the priority list. Yeah. We all have our priority list, one, two, three, four, five, maybe it's ten, I get about three or four. God, family, church, friends, Hobbies. I never get down to hobbies. I never get to hobbies. Hobbies are not uh, like, what's your hobby? I was asked this, like, what's your hobby? Like, I don't have hobbies because I never get to number four. Because anything that I do for fun, I do with my family or with my church. So anyway, so you integrate it all. But this, it, it took me years because I always thought one, two, three, four, five. And how do I keep God at number one in everything? Because you got to work, you got to eat, you need to pay bills. And after meditating on this scripture for years and years and years, I realized that it's not a priority list or a hierarchy waterfall that we run things down, but it's that Jesus becomes the center of it all. Yes. The way you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength is to make sure that he's at the center of it all. That if I make sure that God is at the center of my marriage... That's loving him with all that I have. But make sure that God is at the center of being, being a father. Then I have wisdom when I need to share wisdom with my kids. But I'll also, when I've 
when I've overstepped my bounds or I've been too harsh, my heart is sensitive enough to, to ask my kids to forgive me. Yes. Like you've asked your kids to forgive you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because they needed to forgive me. Right. Jesus at the center of the church. Right. Jesus at the center of my work. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It, everything else hangs on that. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this has been something I've meditated on for, for years. Not only does it mean to be kind, and we get the parable of the Good Samaritan in a response of, in another gospel, that our neighbor or those that are far from us, that are not like us, that the, our neighbor is the people around us. Yeah. And it truly means to be kind. It means to be generous. It means to go the extra mile. It means to take the humble approach without being a doormat ourselves. Can you say Amen. It means being able to, to give a hand up, not, but it doesn't mean to always give a hand out. Like we get frustrated sometimes, and you might be frustrated in giving out because you're giving handouts instead of hand ups. And you need to know the difference and ask for wisdom. But when is this a hand up and when is it a hand out? Because I'm all for giving hand ups. I'll give a few handouts, but eventually I get exhausted with it. But the other side of this, after meditating on this for years, was this. I love my neighbor as I set myself, which means I need to treat myself well, too. Can you say amen? amen. Yes. It means if I don't take care of myself, I can't take care of other people. Yes. And those of you that have great compassion and big hearts for other people, you will do for someone else what you would never do for yourself. you will give grace to hundreds and hundreds of other people, but yet hold yourself to a standard that you would have to be perfect to obtain. Yeah, you're right. Amen. On the other side is, is you'd give great advice to someone else getting their life in order, but you struggle to take your own advice. Loving yourself means means treating myself in a way that I'm taking care of myself, not in a selfish way, but in a way that makes sense and is reasonable and has wisdom. Can you say amen? amen. Someone comes to you with an affliction and they said, hey, the doctors prescribed me this medication and I need to take it once a day, every day for 90 days. And if I follow that prescription, my condition will be, it'll, it'll be taken care of. And they're going, I'm really struggling to take that advice. And as, if you're a good friend, you're going to tell them, well, take the medication the way it's prescribed every single day, right? Amen. Because that's wisdom. And we'll give that freely out to someone else, but we have a hard time applying it to ourselves. And to treat ourselves in a way that we love ourselves too. Not in the self-esteem way that certain, that's been perverted over the years of loving self in that way. We shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Treat yourself like someone that's worthy of being taken care of. <clears throat> we'll close with this because I'm about out of steam. At the core, the core of what we're talking about today is the Father's love. That we're looking for love and we're looking to be loved. We're looking for a love that cares, that genuinely cares. Can you say amen? Yeah. True love that cares. I want to be around people that genuinely care for me. And I want to genuinely care for other people. Number two, I want to have a love that connects. A love that connects. It, it's hard to be loved. It's hard to be loving. It's hard to receive love. It's hard to give love if there's no connection. But I, I have, we all have our issues. Can you say amen? Yes. We all have, like, if you haven't been wise at making connections, then you need, to show, you need to show prudence and wisdom on how you make connections. But let me say this, there are some good folks in here that you can make some good connections with that will help heal 
and restore some trust. Can you say amen? We're looking for a love that connects. And last of all, we're looking for a committed love. We're looking for a committed love. Um, my wife and I, we've been married for over 20 years now. <clears throat> and we've had all of our, we've had our ups, we've had our downs. Praise God, we've had way more ups than we've had downs. Even in the midst of our downs, there's been a commitment to each other that extends beyond I like her or he likes me. Because sometimes I'm not very likable. But there's a commitment. There's a commitment to each other. And there's a commitment to our God. And there's a commitment to our vows that we made in the presence of many witnesses. That we're looking for a love that's committed, that endures until the end. A love that goes beyond bankruptcies and frustrations and irritations and mistakes and bad choices. But let me just say this, just because someone has a committed love, do not think that it is, it is inexhaustible. That you cannot continue to go around making a bone, but being a bonehead and expect someone to become a doormat. We stand, we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Amen. Wives submit to your husbands. Can you say amen? That's the order that God designed to the family. We're looking for committed love. And there's no more committed love that we can have than the love that Jesus has for us. And we in turn, we're committed to him. Fully committed. There's no turning back. There's absolutely no turning back. Regardless of the crowds, regardless of the other voices, regardless of whoever else is walking step in step, though none go with me, still I will follow. That I've decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back. I place my hand to the plow and I'm not looking back. I've taken up my cross and I'm following Jesus. What about my friends? What about my family? My commitment to Jesus is me and him. And he's never going to leave me, nor will he forsake me. A caring, connected, committed love. And we can see from the parable of the lost son, <clears throat> from the scriptures we read today, there's no more caring love than the love the Father has for us. There's no more greater connection that we can have than our connection with our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father shows the greatest commitment with the love that Jesus shares for us. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Jim.